Hey guys, and welcome to episode two in a series where we're going through this book, Logical Chess Move by Move. Hopefully you have a copy and you're going through it with us. If not, that's okay. You're still gonna get some nice takeaways from this series. By the way, if you're wondering if a video is part of this series, look for this symbol. I'm gonna throw it up on the screen right now. If you see that symbol, you'll know that the video is part of this series. So that's how you can easily tell, okay? The second thing I wanna mention, I had said initially we're gonna do this every two weeks, but I think we are gonna to try to do a game every week, all right? A lot of people were saying they can't wait for the next episode and they wanted it a little bit more, more uh, frequently. So we're gonna to try to do one game a week and the games are pretty short, so I don't think you're, you'll have too much trouble keeping up with that. And if it is too fast for you, feel free to just go at your own pace and watch the next video when you're ready. There's no, you know, you don't have to watch it the day that it comes out, right? So take your time with that if you need to. All right. Uh, before we get started with today's game, game number two, I want to answer three questions that people asked from the last video. Okay, so let me just jump back here for a second. This was the game that we looked at last time. And right at this moment in the game, white played the move h3. And if you remember, we talked about why this was a critical mistake. And it weakens the king side, it weakens this g3 square. And we saw over the next few moves how black was able to take advantage of that, and white got into trouble. But somebody commented and said, hey, at the beginner level, a lot of people actually get back rank checkmated when they don't move their pawns. So I want to draw your attention to this position. Okay, this is an endgame position. And just imagine for a second that white decides to bring the rook up and start attacking pawns. Well, just like this person said, they're gonna get checkmated on the back rank because they didn't move any of these pawns, okay? So this is a valid concern, but there's something very important that you need to understand. Early in the game, early to mid game, moving these pawns in front of your king is a very big weakness. And, and we saw that. We saw how this person got attacked and lost the game, right? But as you get towards the end of the game, it becomes less and less of a weakness and more and more beneficial to make a move like h3 because yes, now you're not getting back rank checkmated. You've created a space for your king to go, but you don't wanna do it so early. You don't wanna just like, oh, the game just started. I don't wanna get back rank checkmated. Let me just play h3. That's way too early, and we saw why that's bad. So it's it's important that you understand what phase of the game are you in before you play a move like h3, okay? But that was a very good point, and it is something that you want to be aware of. Another way that you can do it is by playing the move king to f1. Again, at the end of the game, I would play this. Early in the game, I would not try to move my king over to f1. It doesn't make as much sense. But at the end of the game, it makes a lot of sense because now you can... Bring the king out, maybe head over to this side of the board if you want, head over this way. Of course, the rook is blocking you, but you get the idea. It lets your king out to start moving around, okay? So just keep that in mind. Hopefully that, that kind of answers that, but thank you for bringing that up. Okay, let's go on to the second question here. So the next thing I want to talk about as we go, went through this game, there was this critical moment in the game where black sacrificed the bishop on h3. You'll remember this from last time. Somebody asked the question, what about instead of sacrificing, why don't we just play queen to g3? And remember, we've got the bishop pinning the pawn there, so the pawn can't take us. And we're threatening now to take this and then checkmate with the queen. And what, why not do it this way? Like, why, why start with the bishop sacrifice? So I'm going to answer that, but I, I want you guys to think about it. What do, you, what do you think? Like, do you think this is a better way to attack or not as good of a way as taking with the bishop first? Go ahead and think through that for just a second. All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, this is a very, very important question because you're gonna be presented with situations like this a lot in chess where you have multiple options and they're kind of related. Like you're probably gonna play both moves, but maybe you could start with this one and then play the other one or start with the other one and then play this one, right? That's exactly what we see here where it's like, well, you could sack first, but you could also bring the queen in first. Why should you do one over the other? Here is what, what I think is the problem with queen to g3. The problem with queen to g3 is it doesn't create an immediate powerful threat. I mean, yes, you're bringing the queen close to the king, which is cool. And yes, you're threatening to go here and take a pawn. But other than that, white is basically free to do whatever they want to do. Any move on the board is essentially fair game for white. And what does that mean for you? That means you have to consider all of these possibilities. If we compare that to bishop takes h3... There's really only one move that makes sense for white. It's like you got to take the bishop. Otherwise, you just lost a pawn in front of your king for no reason. And you, you could play another move, but then I might just move my bishop back and be happy I got a pawn. It's a very powerful threat. Another one 
are checks. So as we went through this game, white captured, and the follow-up was a check. Very powerful because you don't have an option to do anything else. You have to move your king. And then we took the pawn again with check. You don't have an option. You have to move your king. You see how forcing that was, right? It didn't really give white a lot of options. Now let's compare that. Queen to g3. Well, what is white going to play? I, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. You better consider every single move on the board if you're going to play this. And actually, there's a really powerful move here for white. King to h1. And some of you might be thinking, well, why don't we just sack the bishop like we were planning and we're going to get the same position, right? No, we're not. Because as soon as you do that, what's white going to play? That's right. For those of you who are paying attention, they stepped out of the pin. They're going to just take your queen. And now you're going to lose the game. because You're not going to be able to, you know, checkmate without the queen over here. So what does that mean? Well, you're going to be forced to take here. But then they actually have this move e5 starting to attack your king. And if you just try to take that, you're going to play queen to e2. Lining up on the bishop, lining up here, you got to save the bishop. But once you do that, there's even a sacrifice here where it just gets kind of wild. But what ends up happening is white is all of a sudden the one who's attacking you. And how did that happen? Well, it's because we, we switched up the order and we actually allowed white to find this move king to h1. Let's go back to the bishop takes h3. If we play bishop takes h3 and white tries to play king h1 here, we're like, okay, well, now we'll just move our bishop somewhere and the game goes on. Thank you very much. We got a pawn and we're ready to keep attacking. We're pretty happy. So bishop takes h3 was a much more forcing move than queen to g3, and that's very, very important. When you have an option between two moves, usually you want to go with the more forcing one because it limits your opponent's options. Okay, so good question, and I, and I hope that I explain that in a way that makes sense to you guys and why you have to be really careful playing they're called quiet moves, where it's like you're not really threatening anything serious right away. Uh, you got to be careful playing those kind of moves, okay? The, sometimes they're the best move, but when you have a, just a bam, a nice, just clear sacrifice that forces a response, that's better, okay? All right, and one more question that I want to answer here that was asked. Let's keep going in the game. So we went here. We talked about how we bring the knight in. And then in the game, this is what was was showed check followed by the bishop capturing and basically white resigned but i showed you guys that there was this counter attack that white has and i mentioned that the best move instead of actually going for that was to castle queenside and somebody asked a good question they said nelson you don't you the principle that you said earlier was castle early and, and castle uh to the king side when when possible and now you're saying to castle queenside so what's the deal well first of all Every single rule that you that you learn in chess always has a time for it to be broken. Okay, so just keep that in mind. But specifically, why would we want to castle queenside instead of kingside? There's a couple things you want to think about. Number one, you want to think about where are you attacking or where do you plan on attacking in the game? Well, this one, we've already started the attack. The attack's over here. Right? This is the section of the board that we're attacking on. So would I want my king to be on that side or on the other side of the board? Well, usually you want it to be on the other side of the board. So that's one thing. I, my king is just kind of out of the way. Another thing that's really, really important is what do you want your rooks to be doing and how do you best make that happen right away? Okay, so if I castle queenside, I want you to pay close attention to this rook right here. The rook that was on a8 is now on d8 and is actually playing a role in the game because it's lined up with the queen. And you might not think that that's very important. You might say, I mean, who cares? There's a pawn in the way. Like, it's not even threatening the queen. Like, what's the big deal? I'd rather castle over here. Let me show you this line. Let me show you this line here. If we castle here and white plays bishop to f4, they're adding a defensive piece here. And there's a, a move that we would like to be able to play, knight to e5, but they would just take us. And I'm going to explain why, why we want to play knight e5 in just a second. And when we take back, they could play something like knight h2, now the queen's coming over to trade off, and white is actually winning this game. This is a better position for white. Let's go ahead and compare that. Going back here, if we castle queenside, the bishop comes out, and now we play knight to e5. Watch what happens if they try to do the same thing. Takes, takes, and look at this. That rook on a8 is now attacking the queen, and when it moves somewhere, we play rook to d6, we jump over here, and now we're, we're checkmating white and a few moves. It's like mate in 17, but it's it's checkmate. How did that happen? All because this rook was ready to go when we needed it. And that happened because we castled queenside. 
So this is a crucial thing to, to think about. If you're going to need that rook on the D file to be active and helping you right away, then you need to castle queenside. Because if you castle kingside, it just takes you longer to get the rook involved usually. Now there are situations, oops, sorry. There are situations where the F pawn is missing and this bishop's not sitting here and castling kingside allows the rook to be involved straight away that way. That's a different story. But in this case, it, you know, this was the way to go, okay? Also, if we wanted to push this pawn and use it in the attack, I think I would like my rook to be there. So that's another reason why I would rather my rooks be in this configuration than in this configuration, right? The rooks are just more ready to help me attack when I castle queenside. And that might seem like a small thing, but it can make a big difference, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And that's just kind of the general general rule, some things you wanna think about, okay? Very, very good questions from last time. Remember guys, if you have questions, put them in the comments. I am looking and reading, and I'm gonna to try to pick out the ones that, that I think will benefit the most people. Okay, so having said that, I'm going to get a drink of water, and then we're gonna jump straight into game number two. All right, guys, so here we go. Game number two, and we are looking at this from Black's perspective because I want to show you how Black orchestrates the attack on the king side, and we're going to see that. Okay, so e4, e5, the knight develops, attacks the pawn. Black develops, defends the pawn. All right, bishops to c4. We've seen this before. This is one of the very strong attacking pieces, especially in e4 opening, so you want to watch out for that. And Black does the same thing, lines up on the weak square. Okay, and this brings us to. Um, <clears throat> A principle that I wanted to point out, which is that you should move only the pawns that help you develop uh, your pieces, okay? So this pawn was moved forward, and it allows the bishop to be developed. This pawn was moved forward, it allows the bishop to be developed. So if you're if you're wondering, like, which pawn should I move? Should I not move a pawn? Should I move a pawn? Like, ask yourself the question, does it help me develop one of my pieces, one of my knights and bishops or my queen? And if the answer is no, don't move it. If the answer is yes, then move it, right? And that's kind of what we saw here, okay? And then also the kind of the follow-up to that principle is try to move your pieces whenever possible, not your pawns. You want to try to move your knights and bishops and only move the pawns if you have to to get the, the pieces out, okay? So just keep that in mind as we go forward. C3. Now, does this follow that principle or not? Well, I would say that this does follow the principle because the queen is a piece. And a lot of times in, in E4 openings, you're going to castle kingside, and having the option to bring the queen out on this diagonal is a good thing. So I would say, yes, this does allow the development of a piece queen, all right? And it also has important uh, implications for playing D4, which is important. So C3, I, I think, you know, does line up with that principle. What are your options if you think white is going to play D4? For those of you who maybe haven't read the book, what do you think might be a good response here from black? All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, there's really two that I would say come to my mind. The first one is knight to f6. This was not played in the game. But whenever you see c3, usually I'm thinking about knight to f6 because there's no knight that can defend that pawn. So it just seems like it's a more, it's a weaker target now, and knight f6 is a way to attack that. The other one that was played in this game is very interesting, bishop to b6. And what black is doing is saying, look, I know you're going to play d4, and I don't want to have to worry about losing the tempo in the future. I want to have my options open in the future. So I'll move this now ahead of time. And it kind of goes against the principle of don't move your pieces multiple times in the opening that we already learned, right? So this is a good example of how, yes, you have these chess principles that you follow most of the time, but there are exceptions. And so this is, this is principle number two, which I'm basically explaining right now, but don't play chess mechanically. That's what it says in the book, right? Don't, don't go on autopilot and just, well, I always just do this. Well, I always just do this. That's not, I don't care what they do. I'm always, you can't play chess that way and expect to win games. You have to be thinking about, hmm, is this a time to break the principle or not, right? And Black decides, yes, I'm going to break the principle of moving the piece twice to avoid the loss of tempo here, okay? So just keep that in mind. Let's keep going. So D4 was played. And where do we have, let's see, queen to e7. Queen to e7 is a bit of an interesting move, uh, but it is considered a developing move because you do need to, at some point, get the queen off the back rank. And so black's doing it now and lining up here, defending the pawn and putting some pressure on the e-file. So I'm okay with, with that move. White castles. Now, when white castles, what about this e4 pawn? What do you guys think? Should we try to take advantage of the fact that it's undefended? Yes or no? 
Well, if you had a chance to look at that, the answer is no. And the reason is if we were to do this, takes, 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 we're losing our queen to a very simple pin, okay? And this is a very common idea that you want to make sure you're paying attention to. The E pawn in these E, E4, E5 openings, the E pawn a lot of times can be defended indirectly. That's what he mentions in the book, right? You don't actually have to defend it because if it ever gets captured, there's always going to be something you can do with your rook if black's king is still in the center, which in this case it is. Now, if the king was already castled, that's a different story, right? Because then you could just take the pawn and then move your queen away. There's no pin. But in this case, there is. So this is important, especially even from white's perspective, right? If you're thinking like, hmm, he's going to take me and he's going to win my pawn. Do I have to worry about that? Well, no. I'm just going to castle because I'll have my rook. His king is still there. I don't have to worry. Okay, very, very important concept. Please do not forget about this one because it's extremely common. Okay, so white castles and black recognizes that, you know, they can't take the, the pawn and plays knight to f6, which is a good developing move. D5. Now, D5 um, is a move that kind of goes against the principle that we just learned. So can you tell me which principle this is breaking? Well, it's the principle about not moving pawns unless it helps you develop a piece. Does this pawn move help white develop a piece? No, it doesn't, right? So it's breaking that principle. Now, you might be saying, well, isn't this a good thing, though? Like, we're gaining space here. White's gaining space. They're attacking the knight. Like, that seems pretty good, right? And there are advantages to doing that, but there are also drawbacks, which we're going to see in, in just a second. So just keep that in mind. There is a serious drawback about this move, which we're going to see in just a second. Okay, so d5. And here, black makes the decision to go knight to b8. Now, I think a lot of people would play knight to a5 here. And this brings us to principle number four, which is that knights on the rim are grim, okay? You really don't want your knights to be on the side of the board unless, this is the exception, unless they have a very clear follow-up afterwards. So sometimes, for example, like if I wanted to relocate my knight to f4, maybe I would do that, and that's okay. Or in this case, if you were actually able to go to c4 as a follow-up, maybe that's okay. Or if you were like forcing a bishop trade, if the bishop didn't have anywhere to go and you were guaranteed that you could take it, that would be different. In this case, we're not doing that. Um, white would just simply go back, and now where is your knight going to go? If you look carefully, it's actually trapped. And now you have to worry about b4, and I don't know how you're going to save your knight, honestly. I don't think you really can. So that is why we want to avoid the side of the board, and that's why... Going back here is actually better. Now, knight to d8, the reason I wouldn't go here is because it's very awkward, and how am I going to get my knight out? I can't go there, and I can't go to either of these squares, and both of those pawns are blocked by pieces, so it's going to be a very long time before I could get my knight out. On b8, as soon as I move this pawn up and get my bishop out, let's just say, I can very easily go to d7, and then to c5. And this is a very common idea. Whenever a, a pawn is pushed forward like this, it creates a hole that you could potentially take advantage of, right? So the D, you know, the D pawn is no longer controlling here. So by going back here to D7 to C5, now my knight found a nice home. Okay, so a little bit more advanced here when it comes to like relocating the knight. But at the end of the day, it's it's really pretty simple. Don't let your knights get stuck on the side of the board, and you're going to be in good shape. Okay. All right. So knight to B8. Let's keep going. Bishop goes back to D3. Now White is trying to defend the pawn which it's debatable if they even need to worry about that because there's still going to be the rook stuff. But let's just say you did want to defend your pawn. Is bishop to d3 the best way to do it if you're white? And the answer is no, right? You've already moved this piece. Remember, we don't want to move pieces multiple times unless we have to or unless there's a very good reason to. So what's a better way to defend the pawn? Probably knight b to d2, maybe queen to e2, maybe queen to c2, maybe even bishop to g5, kind of pinning the knight to defend it a different way, right? All of these are moves that I would consider. Now, what's interesting is because black played bishop c5 to bishop to b6, and I said it was a good thing. And now I'm saying bishop to c4 to d3 is a bad thing. And the reason has to do with when, when black played bishop to b6, there was a very clear threat that was pretty much guaranteed to happen that black was dealing with in a, a nice way. In this position... There's no threat on this bishop. There's no reason that white needs to even move that, and they have other pieces that need to be developed. So it makes no sense in this position to move the bishop back. You wouldn't be much better off moving these pieces. Okay, do you guys see the difference there? 
So just keep that in mind. D6, great move. It follows the principle, right, of move the pawns that allow your pieces to get into the game. Okay, and now we're getting into the, the interesting moment in this game, okay, where white plays the move H3. Now, I've actually given it that blunder symbol. It's it's not a blunder, okay? This is just me. I was I wanted to make a point that this is not the kind of move that you want to play, even though, yes, you stop the bishop from pinning your knight. Remember, you create weaknesses, permanent weaknesses that you can't fix because pawns do not go backwards in chess, okay? So how do we, if we're playing as black, how do we take advantage of this? Well, you probably saw the thumbnail, so you already know what the move is. And for those of you who read the book, you know the move as well, h6. And it's very um, counterintuitive, like, wait a second, this is a bad move, but this is a good move? What's the difference? Oh, for starters, we have not castled. Our king is not there, so we are not creating weaknesses in front of our king. White is. And that's a huge difference, right? That's a huge difference. What is white's purpose for playing this move? Probably to stop bishop g4. What is our purpose? It's not to stop bishop g5. Our purpose is to launch this pawn. So you can see how the same move, in one case, it's it's just creating weaknesses. In another case, there's clear ideas behind it, right? And this is why chess can be difficult, because you, you have to figure this stuff out as you're playing. Like, is this a time when it's creating weaknesses, or is this a time when it's it has benefits, right? So in this case, it is it is beneficial to black. He's just setting up for the attack, okay? Let's keep going. So queen to e2, finally uh, white develops a piece there, it, it, which is fine, and g5, all right? Launching the attack, and let's keep going. I think this is fine, knight to h2, so white is trying to uh, defend. And by the way, let me just, you know, if white would have played a different move, I wanna show you this, because this is kind of important. Let's just say they would have played, I don't know, knight b to d2. And we played h6, and let's say they play queen e2. We played g5, and I don't know, they just start doing something here. We play g4. White can very easily just hop the knight around. And we have no way to open up the file because there's no pawn here. Imagine if there's a, a pawn on h3, well, we could simply take it and then we would bust open the king. But now we can't. And it's it's very difficult for us to figure out how do we get through because our own pawn is kind of in the way. And that's a clear example of why h3 is such a bad move to play, really, if, if you're worried about getting attacked. Okay, let's go back to the game here. But h3, h6, g5, and knight to h2. So white is trying the plan ahead for this. So what should we do if we're black? If you had a chance to look at that and you read the book, the move is G4. And we're basically saying, look, we don't care. Yes, there's one, two, three, and we only have two defenders, but we don't care. And wh why is it the case? Why do we not care? Well, if you had a chance to look at that, this is uh, brings us to the fifth principle here. Um, it's okay to lose pawns when you're attacking because usually when you're attacking, you're not going to win or lose the game based on who has the most pawns. Usually that's totally irrelevant. You're going to win or lose the game based on can you get a checkmate? Can you find a, a nice tactic to win a big piece like a queen or a rook or a knight? And if you can, you're going to win. And if you can't and your opponent defends perfectly, they're probably going to win. But it's probably going to have nothing to do with, oh, I lost a pawn, and now he just has an extra pawn. It has nothing to do with that, right? So that's why we don't care. What's more important, if this were to happen, is that we open up the G file, right? We open up the G file. That's what's most important. And I don't, I can't remember, did White? Yeah, White did play that in the game. Um, maybe a better try would have been something like trying to push by, but even then we could still, again, same principle of like, I don't care if we lose the pawn, we're just going to bust it open, keep attacking. The, the important thing is you want to remember, if you can create an open file where the rook can get involved, that's where the attack becomes very, very powerful, okay? So we don't care that we're losing a pawn. Oh, and by the way, by the way, there is another principle. This is a bonus one. I didn't think about this until just now. There's a bonus principle in chess that says when, when somebody's attacking on the flank, you should counterattack in the center. I want to ask you guys a question. What is preventing white from counterattacking in the center? If you had a chance to think about that, this is a tricky question, but the fact that they played d5 earlier is what's preventing them. Because look at these pawns. They're locked up. The center is totally blocked off. What are you going to do if you're white? You can't, you can't do anything. Imagine if this pawn was here. You could take, 
and you could force an open file and you could maybe start to use your pieces on that file and, and somehow figure something out. But when it's totally locked up, you can't do anything. Remember earlier when I said we were going to come back and talk about D5, right? That's another thing. If you're, if you're castled on a flank and your opponent has not, and you lock up the center, you better get ready for an attack because really you're, you're not going to have another option. Like normally you would have another option to counterattack in the center. Now you don't have that. You have to just defend. So very, very critical thing to, to keep in mind there. Okay. All right, let's keep going. So G4 takes and what happened next? Rook to G8. Great. He's bringing in the rook, lining up. Now he is threatening to take. Remember, this guy is pinned, so you can't use that if you're if you're white. Bishop takes h6. Okay. Very, very greedy move. And again, going back to actually, this is the sixth principle I was going to mention. Um, don't grab pawns at the expense of your development. Okay. Usually grabbing a pawn like this is not going to be as good as just developing a piece. Like for example, something like bishop to e3, where you're developing a piece, you're also dealing with this very annoying bishop, right? Because if you're able to trade that off, you no longer have to worry about the problems along that diagonal. But instead, white, sorry, instead white decides just grab a, you know, a pawn. Another thing is I would say never grab pawns like this in front of your castled king because you've now just opened up another file that you have to worry about where a rook or a queen can attack you. Very, very dangerous. Not recommended. Okay? Let's keep going. So knight takes g4. And really, at this point, it's already over. I mean, it's just a matter of can you find the finishing touch here. So let's take a look at that. Now he goes back trying to defend. It's just a little bit too late. If you would like to pause, if you haven't read the book, what's the follow-up here? All right, if you had a chance to look at that, it's just simply taking on h2. Very simple stuff here. King's going to take you back, and then you can jump in with the queen. King has to go back, and if you would like to pause, what's the final blow here? If you had a chance to look at that. The move is queen to h3, and this is important. I want to mention this. Even though you have a winning position, everything looks great, you still have to play the right move because I think a lot of people might be tempted here to play this move. Just lining up on the file thinking that you're going to come down here and checkmate. And the problem with that is it allows f3. And yes, you can come down somewhere, but the king is actually going to escape. And it's still good for black, but how do you actually checkmate? It's, I don't know, right? Because there's, it's hard to deal with this now. So the, the point and the key takeaway is when you get to these really, really good positions, make sure you find the best move possible, the best move possible. And in this case, it's queen h3. And it's because we're threatening the checkmate here. And how does white deal with that? You can't go queen f3 because we just take it because of the pin. So what do you do instead? Well, the only way to defend that would be to play like f3 to allow the queen. But then we have a different follow-up if you'd like to pause. That's correct. Bishop takes e3 check and it forces the queen to capture, but also lures it away from the square and we have checkmate. Okay, so, you know... Yes, the position was amazing, but you still had to find the correct move, and that's very, very important. Why, why tactics and working on solving those puzzles where you, you know, you, you work on checkmates is important. Okay, so that's it, guys. Those are the six principles. Um, I hope that helps. Make sure if you have things you want to mention, comments, questions, put them in in the description, and we'll talk about those on the next episode, which will be a week from today. Every Friday, I'm gonna try to post. A new one. So homework for next time is going to be game number three, which starts on page 23 um, and goes to, I don't know, like 29, 23 to 29. All right. Thank you guys. And I'll see you next time. Stay sharp, play smart and take care.